Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, Taiwan Politics from the Perspective of the Democratic Progressive Party. And joining us uh, from Taiwan is Dr. Joseph Wu. Uh, Dr. Wu is the Secretary General of the Democratic Progressive Party. After obtaining his PhD degree in political science from The Ohio State University, he returned to Taiwan, where he held a number of very senior positions in the Taiwan government. Uh, he was head of the Mainland Affairs Council. He was Deputy Secretary General of the President's uh, Presidential Office, and later served as the de facto Taiwan Ambassador to the United States. He brings a wealth of knowledge uh, about Taiwan politics, both domestic and international politics, um, uh, to bear. And he also is a highly trusted advisor of DPP uh, presidential candidate Tsai Ing-wen. So we're very, very glad to have Dr. Wu with us today. And uh, we know that he has a lot of information that uh, we can uh, avail ourselves of uh, to improve our knowledge of Taiwan. Welcome to Asian Review. Hi, Bill. Uh, wonderful to see you on the TV screen. Uh, it's glad, I'm very glad to be on the show. Great, great. Well, we're so glad to have you. Well, let's get right into it. Um, the campaign's moving along. How is it going? Uh, I think it's going uh, very good for us so far. Uh, our candidate, which is the uh, chairman of the PPP, uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, has been running very strong campaign this time. Uh, when we check the uh, popularity uh, in the last few months, uh, she's been ahead way ahead of all other candidates. And at one point, uh, her lead was so great that uh, the KMT, the ruling party right now, has to change its uh, presidential candidate. So for us, uh, it seems to be uh, doing just fine. You know, that's very, very interesting. It seems that, um, that the former KMT presidential candidate, Ms. Hong, did everything that the KMT asked her to, followed all the procedures, yet couldn't garner very much support and was essentially pushed out. Um, Eric Chu, the uh, mayor of uh, New, Taipei, New Taipei and also the current chair of the KMT, is now the presidential candidate. How does his entry into the race change things, or does it change anything? Uh, several things. Uh, he does enjoy a little bit more popular support uh, in the uh, public opinion polls. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say about 5 to 8 percent uh, better than uh, Madame Hong. Uh, but his support is still very far behind from uh, Chairperson Tsai. Uh, many people are saying that uh, his determination to join the race is not to seek election of himself, but to help the DPP, the, the KMT candidate, in the parliamentary elections uh, to prevent the KMT parliamentary candidates from sliding too far. Uh, there were already some speculation that uh, the KMT is going to become a much, much smaller political party. And I think that's what uh, Eric Chu is eyeing on, uh, to give sufficient support to the uh, KMT parliamentary candidates so that the KMT can do a little better in the parliamentary election. That's been my understanding, too. I heard it said, and, and I wonder what you think about this, that Eric Jew entering the race, he's probably not going to win the presidency because, uh, according to yesterday's Taipei Times, which quoted the China Times, a KMT-leaning publication, still Tsai Ing-wen was ahead uh, by a huge margin. And even if James Sung should drop out of the race, probably that's only going to increase her support. But at the same time, I've heard that Eric Jews, as you suggested, uh, entry into the race is so designed to save the Kuomintang 10 seats. They feel that with him in the race, they'll be able to save or at least come out with 10 more seats than they otherwise might uh, with Ms. Hong as the, as the nominee. Is that sound right to you? Uh, that sounds right. Uh, at least that's in the KMT calculation. Mm -hmm. And that has been said by the KMT side that uh, they're trying to win back uh, some of the seats that seems to be uh, sliding down. Uh, but uh, the way we look at the, the competition is that the KMT is the richest political party in the world. Yeah. Uh, the KMT has a fabulous party asset. Right. And uh, Madam Hong, since uh, she was uh, being nominated by the KMT, she decided that not to receive 
uh, funding uh, based on the KMT party headset. And uh, because of that, uh, her support is uh, sliding. And the KMT candidate in the legislative Vienna election is also uh, sliding. And uh, since Eric Chu is the chairperson of the KMT, and therefore he can use that kind of uh, resources not only to help himself, but also to help the uh, parliamentary candidate on the KMT side. Uh, even though, even though uh, Eric Chu or the KMT side is uh, eyeing on you know, more or less 10 seats, if you look at the uh, public opinion surveys, the KMT might not be able to uh, change that much by changing its presidential candidate. The KMT is a, is a deeply divided party, isn't it? I mean, even, even, uh, as of, even with the so-called as of late um, friendship or display of friendship between Wang Jinping and Eric Zhu, still it's a deeply divided party as I see it. Yes, uh, I probably shouldn't comment too much on the KMT. Okay, I'm fair enough, DVD fair enough. Member, but I, you know, <laughs> I, I can uh, say what I perceive as the divisiveness in the KMT. Uh, still remember, uh, presidential, presidential, uh, President Ma uh, was trying to uh, oust Speaker Wang, mm. who is probably the most popular uh, KMT politician within the KMT. Uh, and therefore, that created a very serious problem between President Ma and Speaker Wang. Mm. And we also heard that President Ma was not in good terms with uh, uh, Mr. Lian Zhan, who was the uh, former mm. uh, vice president and mm. who attended the uh, military parade in uh, Beijing on uh, September 3rd. And uh, there was also some problem between, president, uh, in between the president and Eric Chu because uh, the president was supporting Madame Hong a little bit earlier. So the public perception of the KMT is that uh, the KMT is seriously divided and there's not a clear leader within the KMT that can lead the whole party. Uh, even though President Ma is still in power, but his personality doesn't seem to be uniting uh, the KMT. Yeah, that's my perspective too. He, he seems to um, just never able to get along with Wang Jingping. He's always sort of, there's an vendetta going on between the two and um, it, it really hurts the KMT. Um, that's right, if he, is, if he cannot get along with the uh, some of the most popular people within the KMT, and you can imagine how he can get along with the uh, opposition. And in fact, he is being uh, criticizing the, the, the opposition all the time, ever since day one, he was in office in 2008. And you can see that created a very uh, polarized Taiwan society, and it's become a problem for us. Mm, mm, boy, that's a good point. That's a really good point. Um, just a kind of a, um, a parenthetical question here. Yossi Kun ran against uh, Eric Zhu in the, the recent 9-1 election. He did very, very well, came very, very close to winning. Uh, might he have his eyes on running for that seat again? Uh, that is a distinct possibility. Uh, Eric Zhu was uh, popularly predicted to have a, a landslide victory. Uh, in last year's uh, November election for Xinbei mayorship. Mm. Uh, but the result of the election was uh, only a thin margin. It's a very, very, very small margin. And uh, Yoshi Kun has been said uh, as, as a hero uh, within the DPP for uh, render uh, such a popular KMT politician with such a disas disastrous victory. Right. And for a while, uh, Eric Chu uh, you know, stopped talking about his presidential race. So Yoshi Kun seems to be a very strong candidate on our side. But Yoshi Kun is only one of uh, two candidates that are very strong in uh, Xinbei City. Uh, remember former uh, Premier Su Zhenchang? Right. He used to head uh, Taipei County, you know, now Xinbei City. Right. And it's still very popular. And when we run the public opinion surveys, uh, Su Zhenchang is even more popular than uh, Yoshi Kun in the uh, Xinbei race. Oh, is so that right? If, uh, Eric Chu, that's right. So if uh, uh, Eric Chu decides to uh, drop out of uh, Xinbei City, and there has to be a re-election, uh, both Yoshi Kun and uh, Su Zhenchang uh, look possible to defeat the KMT candidate. But of course, uh, Eric Chu decides to stay on. And it mm. only take uh, three months off during the campaign period. So there's no chance for that election, re-election to take place. Well, um, 
Talking about the presidential race, um, I haven't, maybe I missed it, but I haven't seen any names um, put forward as vice, pre vice presidential candidates on the DPP side. Can you tell us who might be on the, the list of possible VP um, candidates? Well, the uh, formal uh, registration to the uh, Central Election Commission is on November 23rd. Okay. And therefore, by that day, we will know who is the running mate of uh, Chairperson Tsai. And we will also know the running mate for uh, Eric Chu and James Song, who is the third candidate. Uh, but during this period of time, we in the party do not talk about this issue. This is for the chairperson or for our presidential candidate to decide. What's your prediction? Will James Sung stay in the race or get out? Uh, my hunch is that uh, he's going to stay on. Mm. Uh, not for the reason of his election as the uh, uh, you know, presidential candidate to win the election. But I think he is... Uh, he is eyeing on the, the uh, election of his uh, legislators. Uh, if oh. he drops out of the race, his uh, legislative candidates uh, are going to be in serious trouble because they need James Song's popularity to bring them to uh, their victories. Oh, I see. That's a, that's a, that's a very interesting point. Oh, that's good. Um, okay. Now, Washington... I believe, has tried to remain very neutral in this upcoming race. <clears throat> they, in the last presidential race, they were criticized for leaning towards the KMT. It seems to me, at least so far, <coughs> excuse me, that um, they've tried to remain very neutral. But especially, I suspect, with a kind of a weak candidate as Ms. Hong in the race. But now that Eric Ju is in the race, how do you see Washington responding do you think they're going to still maintain this very neutral position or are they going to lean one way or the other what's your i i i'm sure this must have been a concern in the dpp well in the uh, last presidential election in 2011 2012 uh people did perceive that the uh, u.s administration did not seem to be that fair uh to a taiwan's presidential election uh, but in the last few years, we tried very hard to uh, maintain the very close uh, connections and communications with the administration and with the AIT in Taiwan mm -hmm. so that the U.S. side can fully understand us. And uh, we've been working very hard. And up until this day, our uh, understanding is that the United States is going to remain neutral throughout the election. Uh, remember... Uh, the chairperson led a very big delegation to visit Washington, D.C. in June. Right. And she met with the administration officials. Uh, she was allowed to enter into uh, government institutions for the first time ever. Right. And uh, you can see that uh, the United States seems to be a uh, welcoming uh, chairperson Tsai. And that is also the uh, public perception in Taiwan these days. Uh, even though Eric Chu seemed to be a little bit stronger than Madam Hong, and Eric Chu seemed to be uh, setting out to visit Washington, D.C. very soon. Right. But I see no indication that Washington, D.C. is changing its uh, neutrality. Uh, I've been receiving words uh, again and again from uh, my friends in the administration or from the AIT over here that the United States is going to remain neutral. And the United States is going to work with uh, whoever is elected and work with the elected publicly elected and democratically elected uh, government here in Taiwan. So all those kinds of reassurances uh, seem to be uh, very strong. Speaking of the U.S. government, I see behind you a U.S. flag. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, I, I served in uh, Washington, D.C. as a Taiwan's representative in uh, diplomatic jargon. Uh, ambassador. You know, it's, it's ambassadorship. Uh, but since Taiwan and the United States do not have a formal uh, diplomatic ties. So we call our representative or our ambassadors in uh, Washington, D.C. as a representative. And I served as Taiwan's representative in uh, Washington, D.C. for uh, a while. And uh, when I was uh, returning to Taiwan in 2008, uh, a congressman just gave that flag to me. And that flag was actually flown on the Capitol before. Wh which, ca which congressman was that, if you don't mind saying? Uh, Pete Session. Great, great. Congressman Session. Great. 
Um, well, we're going to go ahead here and take a break. Uh, you're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Uh, my guest today is Dr. Joseph Wu, visiting us uh, from Taipei, Taiwan, via Skype. We're having a very interesting discussion on the Democratic Progressive Party as it leads up to the January 2016 uh, presidential and legislative election. And we'll be right back. Hi, Jay. Hi, Hi Jay. <laughs> My name is Keith Bettinger. I knew that. And I'm the host of Think Tech Asia. I knew that too. Here on Think Tech. Fabulous. Uh, You've got a great show going, thank Keith. Thank you very much. And for uh, our viewers out there that are interested in Think Tech Asia, it airs every Tuesday from 4 to 4.45. And uh, it can be accessed online at thinktech.com. Yeah, so what kind of guests do you like? Well, we have a, a number of guests from, from academia, uh, from uh, pr practitioners of international affairs, sometimes we have uh, military officials, sometimes we have public officials on the show. And our goal, uh, we try to talk about uh, current issues in South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and Central Asia, all throughout the Asian realm in more depth than you would find in traditional mainstream That's media. the difference, isn't it? Exactly. That you're, you're reaching out beyond what ordinary news media would do. Right. We're and trying that's to, why we like you so much. We're trying to provide a, a thinking person's perspective, an intelligent perspective on what's going on and where both sides of the story, or even when there's more than two sides, we try to cover every angle. And I think that that's, uh, that's uh, one of the big benefits that we provide here at ThinkTech, is it's a really innovative source of educational programming for the people of Hawaii. You're great, Keith. You're, you are a great host. You've got a great show going on. I watch it every week. Thanks very much. Why don't you guys watch it every week, too, OK? 4.45 to uh, 4 to 4.45 every Tuesday. Business in China. Uh, they better allow uh, the KMT candidate to be elected. So, okay, we're back on the air. You're um, watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Uh, joining us today via Skype from Taiwan is Dr. Joseph Wu. Dr. Wu is the Secretary General of the Democratic Progressive Party. He is a very trusted advisor of presidential candidate uh, Tsai Ing-wen. He brings a wealth of knowledge to us uh, about all aspects of uh, Taiwan politics. Um, just before the break, we were talking about um, uh, America's perspective on the election. And I think we both agreed that America is trying to play a very neutral role, not showing favoritism to any party. But then the other interested external party is China. And uh, in the election of 2012, China tried to use a lot of influence. It tried to manipulate Taiwan businessmen in China. It tried to reach out to Taiwan farmers and make special deals for them. I remember they were very, actually very creative in their approach to the use of milkfish in a way to win votes. Um, how do you see China acting this time around? Uh, it's a little bit different this time. Uh, if you look at the history, China has been trying very hard to, uh, you know, affect or influence Taiwan's uh, politics, especially uh, during election period. Mm -hmm. Still remember quite vividly in 1996 when Taiwan had the uh, first direct presidential election. Uh, China will come back by having some military exercises and tested some of its missiles. But people here in Taiwan decided to vote for the candidate that China did not like, which is uh, <laughs> President Li Denghui. And in year 2000, uh, I still remember Premier Zhu Longji came to uh, the te television uh, screens and uh, threatened the Taiwan voters that uh, if you vote for anyone who stands for uh, Taiwan independence, Taiwan is going to be doomed. Uh, but Taiwan people decided to vote for President Chen. Uh, but in the last presidential election, uh, the Chinese side decided to uh, do something different. Uh, they asked the uh, Taishan or Taiwanese businessmen operating in China uh, <coughs> to take a discounted uh, airfare to come back to Taiwan and vote. Right. And uh, indeed, it was uh, quite a large number uh, who lived in China to come back to Taiwan and vote. And not only the Chinese side decided to provide a discounted airfare for them to come back to vote, uh, they also threatened some of the uh, Taiwanese businessmen that if uh, the opposition is elected, i.e. Tsai ing uh, at that time. Mm. Uh, some of their operations in China might get shut down. Mm. And therefore, they uh, provided a carrot 
at the same time, they got a stick behind them. And therefore, uh, some of the people decided that uh, they should elect uh, President Ma uh, to prevent the uh, cross-site situation from going wrong. And uh, not only the businessmen operating in China were encouraged to take that discounted airfare to come back to Taiwan. In the last presidential election, the Chinese government also forced some very prominent businessmen who does business in China mm. to come out openly uh, to go on television, to go on the newspapers, to say that uh, they support a certain formula uh, of uh, President Ma on the cross rate relations or support President Ma directly. So that seemed to affect it, the election. But this time around, I cannot see any indication so far that the Chinese side is uh, doing the same. Uh, I think that can be uh, seen as uh, one uh, factor that we try to uh, cope with up until this day. Uh, Chairperson Tsai has been very careful in handling her cross-rate policy. Uh, she advocated the status quo in the cross-rate relations, and you know the status quo has been uh, supported by absolute majority of the people here in Taiwan. And the international community also support that formula. So up until this day, China doesn't seem to be uh, having any clue or any excuse uh, to be nasty at the DPP. You know, that's, uh, that, that's very interesting. But let me ask you this. What's the status yes. quo? Because there seem to be a wide variety of interpretations of what the status quo is. So how would you define it? Well, I think, you know, there's a different interpretation of the status quo, but the most popular interpretation of the status quo is that Taiwan is already a democracy. And the people in Taiwan should be the people to decide Taiwan's future. And this is the most popular uh, interpretation of the status quo over here. And this is the, the interpretation that's supported by the absolute majority of the people in Taiwan. But of course, it also leaves some uh, room for maneuver in between Taiwan and China uh, for a better relations between the future Taiwan and the Chinese side. As long as we're talking about the status quo, the other often contentious issue that comes up, the issue in which um, Dr. Tsai has pushed quite a lot on is the 92 consensus. Um, what's your take on that? Where, where does the DPP stand on the 92 consensus? What's the official position of the DPP on the 92 consensus? Well, back in 1992, uh, the two sides uh, of the Taiwan Strait uh, wanted to talk about uh, the issue of uh, the definition of one China mm -hmm. uh, as the basis to move ahead to some other issues. Uh, but uh, in 1992 and the first part of the uh, 1993, there wasn't any subsequent discussion, even though there were exchanges in between the two. But in 1993, the two sides decided to move on to uh, Singapore first Guam meeting without any consensus on that one China. And therefore, if you read memo of uh, Gu Zhenpu, the chief negotiator mm -hmm. of Taiwan at the time, he said it very clearly that there was no consensus in 1992. At most, you can describe it as a mutual understanding in between the two sides. Indeed, that was a mutual understanding that we should set aside the differences in between the two to move on for discussions in order to bring the two sides closer together. And if you look at the KMT side, it has its uh, definition of the 1992 consensus, but then it changes its definition uh, you know, every once in a while. And China's definition of the 1992 consensus is very different from uh, the KMT's interpretation of 1992 consensus. Uh, even Eric Chu's take is different from President Ma's take. And therefore, you know, having some problematic formulation as the basis for the two sides to negotiate with each other may not be the best way to go. However, we are willing to be open uh, so that the DPP can uh, speak with the Chinese side. Uh, to come up with a better foundation for us to move on for negotiations. You said a lot of interesting things there. Um, you know, one thing that strikes me, and, and 
I, I um, don't think I'm the only one that feels this way because I, this view, I think, is reflected in a lot of things that I read, is that the 92 consensus is becoming less and less relevant every day. And that there seems to be a growing number of interpretations of it which sort of diminish any Im impact that it might have. And even the so-called coiner of that expression, Xu Qi, he essentially says that, you know, well, I just kind of made it up, you know, it was kind of a thought of the moment, and it, it was for one reason or another, it stuck around. That's right. I, I think you are right uh, that uh, 1992 consensus seems to be uh, less relevant these days, even, you know, as you say, Xu Qi uh, mentioned about that, and uh, Xu Qi also said in a conference that we held inside the DPP that the 1992 consensus is not relevant to, is not as relevant to the cross relations these days. Uh, indeed, uh, Taiwan and China should get along. Taiwan and China should try to find a way to prevent war from taking place. Uh, if war takes place, it's going to be a disaster. Right, not only right, for right. the people in Taiwan, but also for uh, people in China. And I think it will also be a disaster for any country that has an interest in the peace and stability in this region. And our uh, recommendation is for Taiwan and China to be able to speak directly with each other. Uh, in the last uh, 20 years also, uh, the two sides were able to speak with each other, to establish uh, connections with each other. We have also have tourists coming back and forth. Uh, we are doing business quite freely. And we also have uh, all kinds of agreements in between Taiwan and China. And I think all these should serve as a foundation for us to move forward. Actually, why, on one hand, China says, well, that unless the DPP acknowledges that there's only one China, that we're not going to talk to them. But in actuality, there's a lot of communication going on between the DPP and the mainland, as far as I know. It's just uh, below the radar some... screen. <laughs> Well, if it's below the radar screen, then, uh, you know, probably many people won't be able to know it. But, you know, from my perspective, uh, we have a lot of scholars uh, who does cross relations, who does uh, international relations, or who does uh, economic studies, mm -hmm. uh, who are able, you know, who are able to uh, visit China. And there are also Chinese scholars who are able to uh, come to Taiwan. Uh, for discussions, mm -hmm. and uh, we are able to uh, speak to the Chinese visitors uh, quite freely, and the Chinese officials are able to speak with our uh, scholars freely as well, mm -hmm. and this is a very important channel, uh, a public channel for the two sides to understand each other. Uh, the Chinese also allow our legislators or local officials to visit China, and they seem to be uh, very interested in speaking with them, Mm -hmm. And especially now, we have uh, 13 seats in uh, local government, and uh, they have their own contacts inside China. Right. So through this uh, channel, uh, we are also able to uh, speak with the Chinese side. And therefore, if they really want to understand us, they know how to find a way to understand us. And uh, if we want to understand them, we also know how to find a way to understand them. Oh, that's very positive. Well. The campaign, what, what issues is it really going to turn on? The uh, presidential I think the campaign, important... the legislative campaign, what are the real issues that this campaign, these campaigns are going to turn on? Well, I think there are a couple of uh, issues that can be uh, very important. Uh, the first one is, of course, uh, the uh, economy. Mm -hmm. And the second one is governance. Mm -hmm. I would start from the governance. Uh, in the last few years, uh, the government seemed to be not functioning. Uh, President Ma, even though he has a lot of uh, very famous uh, slogans, uh, but he doesn't seem to be able to command uh, his uh, prime minister uh, or his uh, cabinet ministers to do a very good job to implement uh, the policies faithfully. And uh, President Ma also comes, you know, is coming up with uh, too many conflicting ideas uh, to allow uh, the government uh, efficiency to continue to decay in such a degree that there doesn't seem to be a government there. And uh, President Ma is taking on his political opponents within the party mm. or with his uh, opposition uh, all the time uh, that allow Taiwan internal politics uh, to go on in such a degree that people only see partisanship. 
not good policies. And this is something that we need to overcome. And the chairperson has already made the pledge that we will overcome this issue, that we will make Taiwan a more conciliatory society so that we can face our common challenges. And our number one challenge, other than the uh, governance, is our economy. Uh, in the last few years, Taiwan's economy has been doing very well. Uh, we are going to have a new indicator coming out very soon. Uh, the indicator is for quarter three, uh, the third quarter uh, growth rate. And I think it's going to be in the negative territory. And you can see how bad the economy has been doing. Uh, many people understand this indicator even better or feel it even stronger. Is that the real wage has been slammed back to the standard of about 16 years ago. Uh, so uh, many people would expect a new government to be able to handle the economic situation better. And I think the current government has simply run out of ideas to uh, energize Taiwan's economic growth or Taiwan's economic performance. And we have tried many, many ways uh, for Taiwan's economy to be re-energized. You know, for example, as we speak right now, the chairperson is uh, announcing one of our major policy platforms. It's um, biomedical uh, technology uh, cluster in Taiwan. Mm. In northern part of Taiwan, in central part of Taiwan, and in southern part of Taiwan, we will uh, use our research capability in the Academia Seneca together with the testing, clinical uh, testing kinds of ability in Taiwan, together with uh, very good uh, medical services in Taiwan uh, to produce a new uh, medical technology center here in Taipei. Mm. And in Taiwan, in central part of Taiwan, uh, we have uh, very good precision uh, machine tools. And these precision machine tools can be used for medical purposes. And uh, you can uh, create or we can create clusters for biomedical uh, technology centers in, in Taiwan. And that is what we are aiming at. In the last presidential election, uh, the KMT side decided to take on uh, one of uh, new Taiwan's uh, technology is a biochemical, a biotechnology uh, research uh, corporations uh, and uh, accused the chairperson of uh, corruption or wrongdoings, uh, even though that was uh, totally unsubstantiated, uh, is going to have a uh, trial uh, announcement uh, at 11 o'clock today and we are going to win that case. And that, that means the KMT side just want to win a political uh, victory in 2011, but not on the next generation of uh, Taiwan's economy. And what we are eyeing on right now, as the chairperson making announcement of our policy right now, we are going to take Taiwan into the next generation of Taiwan's economic performance. And on Thursday, uh, we will speak about Taiwan's uh, defense industries. You know, in uh, the case before, uh, when we talk about defense or buying weapons uh, from the United States, many people think that uh, we are wasting our money. But if we make investment in Taiwan's own defense industries, that would mean that the capital stays in Taiwan. That would mean technology stay in Taiwan. That would also mean that we control our own defense. So this is what we are thinking. And I think we have the ability and we are determined to take Taiwan into the next generation of economic growth. Wow, that's impressive. Uh, and, and with defense industries, there's always spin-off effects too. I mean, from the US defense industry, we see a lot of spin-off effects, which uh, have very positive results. Uh, we're yes, gonna take exactly. another- That's what we are looking at that as well. Not only spin-off, but also spin-off. <laughs> okay, spin lots. Okay, great. We're going to take another break here. You're watching Asia in Review. My host, uh, I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Dr. Joseph Wu, joining us via Skype from Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, Dr. Wu is the Secretary General of the Democratic Progressive Party. Uh, he's also a very key advisor to um, Tsai Ing-wen, the uh, DPP presidential candidate. Uh, when we come back, I encourage you to tweet in any questions you might have for Dr. Wu. He's extremely knowledgeable and we'll be glad to answer any question you might have. We'll be right back. Here's the deal. 
Um, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm the host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is the Energy Policy Forum's program on Wednesday. That's how we call Wednesday Energy Wednesday. We call it Energy Wednesday every Wednesday. <laughs> Are you surprised? Okay, and we and we try to we get guys like Jim Alberts here from Hawaiian Electric who can tell us what's really going on in energy. We want to be informed. It's so important. It's the most important initiative in our state. <laughs> Clean energy is major, okay? And that's why we cover it on this show. That's the deal. What do you think, Sharon? I think that's great. That's why we're here every Wednesday from 4 to 5, and we hope you all join us so we can hear people like Jim coming on our show and co-host Ray Starling from Hawaii Energy. Okay, Jim, you've been here today. You've seen this. You've heard what she said. What do you think? I think it's a tremendous opportunity for people to come together and talk about the issues. Oftentimes there isn't a good forum to bring these key issues out into the public and this is a tremendous way to go about it. And the, the activity of this show is essential to keep talking about energy because as you said, it's such an essential part of our lives that we need to pay attention to it and we need to think about the future. Okay, Ray, your turn. Well, this is a special time in the history of Hawaii where we're making some pretty radical changes in the way we uh, use energy and generate energy. And this show is the one place you can count on coming to every Wednesday and hearing something about the latest issues that are on the table being discussed that will affect us all going forward. So. Uh, come join us, and if you have some ideas you want to share with us about energy, uh, give us a call and let us know. We'll, we'll put you up here and, uh, and let you talk for an hour. So uh, come see us. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be, from Think Tank's point of view, it's great to have this show. We love the show. It's our, it's our most important <laughs> show. So come around and listen to us 4 to 5 on Wednesday. Thanks a lot. Bye. Aloha. Aloha. Uh, we, we have um, just about four minutes left in the show here. Um, polarization in Taiwan society. I know that Dr. Tsai is extremely worried about that and uh, has mentioned it in a number of um, uh, DPP communications. How does she seek to resolve, to eliminate uh, the polarization in Taiwan society? Well, indeed, polarization is a very serious issue in Taiwan. Uh, people very frequently look at the public issues from green, blue uh, perspective or KMT, DVP perspective. Uh, but it shouldn't be that way, especially when Taiwan sees uh, very uh, serious international challenges, especially ch challenges posed by China. And therefore, we need to find a way to overcome uh, the polarization issue. And Chairperson Tsai, our candidate, our chairperson, uh, has been addressing this issue as the top leader if she were to be elected uh, she will be the president to unite the party and not only she will maintain the posture throughout the election uh, she will also uh, try to uh, work with uh, uh, the opposition who maybe is in the opposition uh, to uh, form committees to discuss very uh, serious challenges that Taiwan is facing uh, for instance uh, the uh, pension system is coming to a collapse. The pension mm. funds are coming to a collapse. And uh, it cannot work uh, without parties working together. And that is exactly the direction we are heading. And you will see these kinds of postures, not only during the campaign period, but throughout the DPP administration in the next four years, even eight years. You know, from my perspective, you know, sitting here in Honolulu and obviously not being a citizen of the Republic of China, not voting in Taiwan and all that. Uh, I, 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 you know, I think it's such a shame to see that everything that Taiwan has accomplished, you know, democratization, economic wealth, it is sort of held in abeyance by this polarization in Taiwan society. And there seem to be many facets to it. Um, to me, it would be really ideal if there could be, I'm going to coin a term here, a turquoiseization of Taiwan society, a bringing together the blue and the green. And sometimes I think that the light blue and the light green are really not that far apart on a lot of issues that perhaps with a, um, 
to be president-sized leadership, there, that, that, that sort of change can come about. And that, that would be so great for Taiwan and for the region and uh, also would be um, uh, an inspiration for other societies as well. That's right. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, but I think we need to start from uh, the key leadership. And the key leadership is the president. Uh, and if you look at the uh, polarization situation in Taiwan these days, I would say President Ma needs to share a lot of uh, responsibility. And certainly he's not helping uh, to bridge the gap in between the greens and blues. Mm. Uh, he's not even to, able to uh, bridge the gap in between him and Speaker Wong. Uh, so if we have a new leadership, uh, mm. you know, even uh, if it's the KMT that is to be elected, uh, I would say the KMT future leadership is going to be better than the current uh, president of Taiwan. And certainly, it's our candidate is going to be, as the survey shows, our candidate is to be elected as the president. And she has that conciliatory attitude. She understands the importance of uh, national uh, reconciliation. And she understands that in order for Taiwan to face the common challenges, we need to unite and we need to maintain that posture for Taiwan to move on. That's great. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. We're just about out of time. Um, I, I think you gave us a lot of very interesting information and, uh, and you're, you're so knowledgeable about the inner workings of the Taiwan government. As I've said to you on many occasions, one of these days you've just got to sit down and write a book uh, because you're just uh, this, the walking wealth of knowledge. And I, I'm really glad that you could join us today. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in Taiwan or in Hawaii or Washington or wherever. Thanks for joining yeah, thank us. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me on the show. I look forward to seeing you again. Okay, thank you again. And thank you very much for watching. Um, uh, my guest next week will be the former de facto U.S. ambassador to Taiwan, uh, Bill Stanton. Uh, Bill Stanton retired from the United States State Department about three years ago and elected to stay on in Taiwan. He now is, uh, has an academic and administrative position at National Tsinghua University, uh, where he runs the Center for Asian Policy. Uh, he very recently uh, made some very strong statements and very strong criticism of U.S.-China policy. Uh, and he's going to share some of his thoughts uh, on that with us next week. So sh be sure to join us. And thank you for uh, joining us today. And see you next week. <laughs>